wonder what Mikkel would have said if she had seen David dance like that. Oh, praise be to God. Praise be to God. What an honor and what a joy it is not to stand here, but just to be counted among the saints of God, just to be in the number. God is a good God. God is an awesome God. And now, now I'm Baptist, so I have to do the Baptist thing. Okay? Giving honor to God who's the head of my life. To my pastor, the Reverend Jeffrey Brown. Anybody from Boston in the house? I, I, I just wanted to check. Amen, amen, amen. Oh, ha <laughs> ha. I do bring you greetings from that great commonwealth of Massachusetts. But more than that, more than that, from the one who created us, from the one who from the dawn of time knew we would be in this room, from the one who ordained your ministry and mine, for the one who knows about that mess in your life that you're trying to hide from the people in this room and who chose you and is using you anyway, cracked vessels that we are, got a plan for our life. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh God, oh God. And I need my husband because he's my timekeeper and he's back in Boston, so you all pray with me that God has God's way in this time we spend together. Oh, is there a word from the Lord? Is there a word from the Lord? And I don't assume that everybody has read this passage, so if you'll just turn with me in your sword, and if you can't see because it's dark, that's all right. Just prepare your heart and listen for the word of the Lord from the gospel according to Mark, from the shortest gospel in the book, the one that doesn't lay, waste an, a single word, from the gospel of Mark in the 14th chapter. In the 14th chapter, beginning with the third verse. When you find it, say amen. The gospel of Mark, the gospel of Mark, 14th chapter. Listen <laughs> for the word of the Lord. While he was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of a man known as Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those folk who were present were saying indignantly to one another, why waste this perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, Jesus said. Why are you bothering her? She's done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you'll always have with you, and you can help them at any time, but you'll not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare me for my burial. I tell you the truth. Wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will be told, devil, you're a liar, in memory of her. If I had a text for you, a title for you this morning, it would be your alabaster box. Let's pray. Speak, Lord, that we, your people, might hear you. Hide your daughter behind the sacred redemptive power of your cross, none of me and all of you. And let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. <laughs> for you and you alone are our strength and our Redeemer, and God's people together say, Amen. Amen. I've never been able to stand still. If you believe that every word of God is given for reproof and correction and for teaching and that it's meant to equip us thoroughly for the word, then the Mark text does something different than all of the other texts. You see, that story of a woman anointing Jesus is in every single gospel. In Luke, they make my sister a sinner. And I have you know, the Lucan text does not call her a prostitute, but we certainly like to. We don't know what her sin was. Luke calls her a sinner and brings her to Jesus' feet, and he teaches a parable about forgiveness through her action. That's the Lucan text. And then you get the Matthew text, where we don't know her name, and we don't know if she's a sinner or not, but she comes and again she anoints his head. And it's the Matthew text where the disciples get in her way. And then we come to the John text and to the Mark text. And 
But John text names her for us. She's Mary of Bethany. You know Mary and Martha. You know Lazarus' sister. And in the John text, she anoints him, and we don't know why, but he raised her brother the chapter before. So I imagine she has come to anoint him just to say, thank you, Lord, for giving my brother his life. Thank you, Lord, for not hurrying so you could do your work in your time. Thank you, Lord, for calling me out to meet you and to honor us with your presence. I imagine Mary in the Johannine text was just thanking him. But in the Mark text, they're at Simon the leper's house. And my sister comes and Mark is the only book, the only gospel where she breaks the box at his feet. I don't care whether you read John or Luke or Matthew, she doesn't break the box in those texts. It's only in Mark she comes to Jesus and she breaks her box at his feet and begins to anoint his head. Now, in the first century Jerusalem, that action had meaning. And see, we live so many centuries away. We don't always understand the text, but Jeremiah Wright, one of the pastors in my life, said, if you take a text out of context, it's a pretext. So you've got to put the text in its context to understand what the text is saying to our hearts. In first century Jerusalem, when a woman was born, if her parents were able, they found an alabaster box for her. It was a box of marble, a small box typically, but the richer you were, the larger your box. But when you were a small girl child, your parents bought you this box, and all through your life, you would take every little penny, every little mite, everything you could get your hand on that you didn't have to spend for your living, and you would buy oil and put in your box. And every drop of oil that went into that box was a dream. It was a dream for a happy household. It was a dream for a marriage to a good man. It was a dream for prosperity. It was a dream for a good life. Every little girl had an alabaster box. Every little girl put her dreams in that alabaster box represented by the oil. And we know the oil is the Holy Spirit. But in that time, it was putting your dreams in the box. And then, when that fateful day came, and in that time, it was about 13 or 14 or 15 years of age, when that day came and your parents had found for you the one you were to marry, Your parents had brought to you this man who was going to be the rule of your life from then on. When your parents had found for you the one that they thought would help your dreams come true, you came to him and bowed at his feet and broke your box at his feet. And see, when you broke your box, it meant that nothing else could go in it. When you broke your box, all of your dreams came spilling out. When you broke your box, you were saying, I'm giving you everything I have. You've got to take care of me. I don't have any more property. I don't have any more rights. You're not my husband. You've got to take care of me. Oh, when you broke your box, you could never put it back together. All your stuff started spilling out, and it was now in the hands of this man. She broke her box at Jesus' feet. My sister brought her box, and in her mind, and in her heart, and in her day, it was giving Jesus all she had. It was saying to him, I'm coming to you with my life, whether she's a sinner or not, because the word said all have sinned and come short. She brought her box to his feet and said, I can only give you what little I have, but I'm giving it to you because I trust you. I'm giving it to you because I don't think you'll hurt me. I'm giving it to you because I believe you love me. I'm giving it to you because I believe you'll take care of me. Jesus, I'm going to break my box at your feet. for my sister to even bring her box it had to have something in it that meant she had to have a dream oh my brothers and sisters when you get ready to come to Jesus' feet you have to bring your dreams you see it's a trick of the enemy to tell us we have no dreams It's a trick of the enemy to quash your dreams and to make it look as if they won't succeed. It's a trick of the enemy when people tell you that your dreams are no good. It's a trick of the enemy that that when they tell you that because of your address or because of your messed up life or because of the mistakes you've made that you don't deserve to have dreams. It's a trick of the enemy. No, Psalm 37 forces 
Delight in the Lord and He will give you what? The desires of your heart. Oh, but if we're going to come to Jesus, first we've got to come with our dreams. And I'm not talking about that little dream. I'm not talking about that right now dream. I'm not talking about that dream of taking one thing from this conference and going home and applying it. I'm talking about kingdom-shaking dreams. I'm talking about dreams that are bigger than Pentecost. I'm talking about dreams that revive not only a city or state, but a nation. I'm talking about dreams that will revive that person who lives in your household, whom you're afraid to talk to and bring the gospel to. Those are the kinds of dreams. Some of us have been praying the same dream for 40 years. I'm 43. I may be one of them. Or for 10 years or for 5 years. But you see, you've got to bring your dreams to Jesus. And what I like about the Lord, Dr. Rochester, you said it yesterday, is he doesn't see us as we are. He sees us as we're meant to be. That's why he said to Gideon, almighty oh, man of war, when he was down in a hole, talking about you got the wrong address, God. God sees us not as we are, but as we're meant to be. And God sees our dreams not as they are, but hallelujah, as they're meant to be. And in his word, he said, you do greater things than even I did. Oh, you got to have a dream. And you know that thing, that thing that won't leave you alone. That thing that's been in your heart and keeps rising up. That thing that when you're in that morning time, when all is gray, you can feel it. It's ethereal, but you know it's there. It's that thing that you keep hearing a word of prophecy about in your life, but you won't accept it. And I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about us. God told me for years I was supposed to go to seminary, but I had come up in a church where women were not ordained. The man who baptized me will still not call me Reverend, bless his heart. I still love him. But that dream stayed there until one day Dr. Trudelier Dodd got in my car too on Route 780 between Oakland and Sacramento and said, are you tired of running yet? Oh, and I looked in my rearview mirror because I assumed he was in the back seat. I must be chauffeuring God. And said to him, Lord, don't you know about my life? See, there are things I'll tell God that I can't tell you. I can remind you, God, about a night in Texas when you know what happened. I can remind you, God, about a night in Evanston when you know what happened. Lord, you can't walk me in. God said, I see your daughter not as you are. Oh, but as I've called you to be, what's your dream? What's that thing that bubbles up in you and you just won't admit? What's that thing that you're afraid to speak life into, but you know God has given it to you? Oh, if you're going to come to Jesus, bring all of your dreams. Do you think God is so weak that he can't meet your needs? Do you think he's so frail that he can't understand your dreams? Whatever your dream is. My sister in Mark 14 brought all of her dreams to Jesus, his feet in the first thing we can learn from this sister is that you and I have to bring our dreams to Jesus' feet. But there's something else we learn from my sister in Mark 14. You see, it is in the Matthew text when it's the disciples who block her way. When you get ready to bring your dreams, there's some folk who are going to block your way. And sometimes they have titles out in the world. They're supervisors and they're bosses and they're professors. Sometimes the people who block our dreams are the ones to whom we report or have some kind of secular power over us. Oh, but I like the Matthew text because sometimes the people who, who block our dreams are called reverend. Sometimes they're called deacon. Sometimes they're called elder. Sometimes they're called bishop. Make no mistake about it. All men and women are human. And sometimes the folk who block your dreams, it breaks your heart because they're the ones who should be standing beside you. They're the ones who should be lifting you up in prayer. They're the ones who should be exhorting and encouraging you. And instead they stand like, who do you think you are? Ain't got a degree from seminary, here are all of mine. Haven't been in the world long enough, here's my age. And if we look in the biblical text, it's no different. In the ninth chapter of Matthew, you have the disciples, I mean the disciples blocking the woman with an issue of blood from coming. In the ninth chapter of Mark, they fighting over who is going to be the greatest. In the ninth chapter of, of Acts, Paul is breathing out murderous threats all through the biblical record. Those whom God used often had blockages of the brain and of the spirit. Oh, if you're going to have a dream, if you're going to bring your alabaster box to Jesus' feet. Sometimes you just have to press through the mess. 
Sometimes you have to press through the tradition. Sometimes you have to press through the evil. Sometimes you have to press through the jealousy. Sometimes you have to press through the hurt. Sometimes you have to press through the anger. But you've got to press. You see, my sister didn't belong in that room with Jesus. In her day, women couldn't even come and dine with men. I'm sure she met crossed arms at the front door, but she didn't let it stop her. She knew she had a mission before God. She knew she had something she needed from the master. And none of them hignant head Negroes were going to stop her from getting her way to the master's feet. She pressed through the mess. She did not give up. She did not let somebody say, I know more than you, and she turned and ran. She stood flat-footed and press through the mess if you're going to have dreams. you got to first have them and give them to God. But then you got to get to Jesus with your dreams. And see, sometimes the Lord allows us to go through tests to see how strong we're going to be. Sometimes he puts that mess in front of us or allows it to rise up in front of us to see what we've allowed him to make us to be. Oh, when you have a trial, when you're trying to press to the master with your alabaster box and there are pitfalls and evil folk and obstacles over which you cannot bound, know that that means you're doing something right. You see, the devil doesn't mess with anybody who's not doing anything. You can wear your adversaries and your adversity as a badge of honor because I must be about something because the devil got to gather his forces to come and stop me. Oh, when I face a mess, devil, you're a liar. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Shoot your best shot, devil, not because of who I am but because of whose I am. When you have to press through the mess, count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, because God is saying, I got your back. If he's for us, who? Ha <laughs> ha! Got to have dreams. Got to press through the mess. And then you have to lay them at Jesus' feet. Oh, think about the dreams that you have. Think about what's in your alabaster box. Think about those things you've been holding on to all of these years. And we bring them to the master's feet. We get to see Jesus. We have a mountaintop experience and we lay our dreams at his feet. Lord, I love you. Lord, I've done all I can. I can't do no more. Lord, I'm giving it to you. God, won't you come and bless my dream? We've prayed those prayers. We've been at the altar. We've been on our knees. We've pressed. And now we're in the presence of the Almighty God. We're in the presence of the one who can open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that we won't have room to receive. We're in the presence of the one whom we say we lift up holy hands. We're in the presence of the one to whom we say all power is in your hands. We bring our dreams. And then let the woman embrace our box at his feet. Now this box will never hold anything else. No glue can make it strong enough. Once I break my box at Jesus' feet, I've made a final commitment. I've said to him, I trust you. I love you. I have no power of my own. Lest you take my dream and multiply it, it is no good. Lord, I bring it to you. I break my box. And then our challenge is to leave it there. Once we break the box, we can't take it back. At best, we have to go get a new box. But see, God does not honor our absence of faith. God says, when you've trusted me enough to have a dream, to press through and to leave it at my feet, don't take it back. Because if you take it back, you hinder my power. If you take it back, you slow down the process. If you take it back, you've got to go back to square one. When you break it at his feet, do not collect $200. Do not pass go. Do not go to jail. Do not call your best friend and tell her or him what you did. Do not start a prayer chain then. Just trust the master. Just leave it at his feet, knowing that he has the power to grow it up like that little boy's lunch. He can take our little and make of it so much. There's one more thing that this text does. If you read the Mark text, you see in the first verse, it tells us that Passover was two days away. 
Jesus knew what the next 48 hours, 72 hours, held for him. He knew he was hours away from the betrayal, from the lying, from the Judas kiss. He knew he was hours away from his burial. Nobody else knew. He'd been trying to tell the disciples for chapters, and they never got it. They are conscientiously stupid in Mark. They never get it. But Jesus knew. My sister brought her box and broke it at his feet as an offer of a betrothal, as an offer of her life, as an offer of lifelong commitment in marriage, in relationship. All of the symbolism tied up in that box was clear to her and everybody in the room. But look what Jesus did. He took her offer of betrothal and turned it into an anointment for his burial. My brothers and sisters, if you're going to bring your box, if you're going to press through the mess, if you're going to break it at Jesus' feet, that's not the hard part. Here's the hard part. We have to let Jesus do with our dreams whatever he wants to do. You see, I've got dreams of grand things. I've got dreams of amazing things. I know what the Lord has gifted me to do. I know what I'm supposed to do. So, Lord, here are my dreams. Stamp them with your approval so I can get up and go. Just, just, just rubber stamp them, Lord, because they came from you, so I must understand how you want me to use them. Lord, just mark them okay, and I'm ready to go and to serve you. No. Mm -mm. She came. And he turned it into a death announcement. When you bring your dreams, you have to, I have to, let God do whatever God is going to do with them. See, you may have dreams for this ministry with children. And you might bring that, and God has a ministry for you that has nothing to do with children. It may be their parents that he wants you to get. It may be the elder in the church that he wants you to get. You may have dreams of a youth rally with 200 kids and nobody shows up and God has ratified your dream, just not in the way we can see it. God is God all by God's self. He does not tell us we are going to have success according to the world's standards. He does not tell us we're going to have success according to our standards. He says, come unto me, all ye who labor. I'll give you rest. And if you look at the word rest, it's I'll give you what you need. When we bring our dreams, God can do whatever God wants to do. He doesn't need your permission, and he doesn't need mine. What's that dream that's in your heart? What's that dream that God placed in you before the dawn of time? In obedience will you bring it to him. And even deeper obedience will you allow him to do with it what he will. Will you come and say, Lord, I know in my flesh I want numbers. I know in my flesh I want status and prestige. I know in my flesh I want X or Y, but Lord, you do what you will. I have been preparing for the last seven years to pastor a church and every time I get close God says no my dream is to pastor a church and every time I get close something happens and the job is not mine and God knows I've been on my face before I'm angry Lord you gave me these talents Lord you paid for my seminary education Lord you walked me through that and I graduated summa what's the problem God and God said who, who, whose dream is that when did I ever tell you? I told you to be obedient to me. I don't know yet what God is going to do with my life, but I know that he has plans to prosper me, plans for my hope and for my future. I've been married almost 15 years to a wonderful man. Call me at 6.30 this morning to pray for me. He's a wonderful man. 
I come from a family with amazing parents, mama and daddy, my whole life. I have never been able out of this body to have children. I have two stepchildren, thank you, Lord. But I don't know how many nights I've been on my face with tears wetting my carpet saying, God, why not? God, you gave me every blueprint for being a good parent. God, you've given me a good and a faithful man. Lord, why not? Lord, I'm not happy with you. This is something that I've imagined all my life. It's something that I put in my alabaster box. God, I'm getting older. I, I don't understand. And two years ago, took all my action, whole hysterectomy said clearly to me, stop praying. That's your dream. I got something else for you to do. That might distract you. You might make idols of your children. No. Not wait, not baby. No. We bring our dreams. And he honors the sincere desires of our heart. I'm not telling you not to bring your dreams. Don't misunderstand me. Bring them. Bring them boldly before the throne of grace. Bring them with everything you have and lay them at his feet and then say, Lord, do with them and me what you will. See, we sing songs in church all the time, and I'm about to take my seat. And we sing them, and we don't mean them. We sing all to Jesus, I surrender, all to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. All to Jesus I surrender, Lord I give myself to thee. Let me feel thy love and power, let thy blessings fall on me. And then mad, when Jesus says you're mine, to do with as I please. Not your will, but mine. In your seat when you came in here this morning was a little card. And on that card it says, Lord, I lay this box with all of its dreams at your feet. Do with them and me what you will. We got too many folk in here to do an altar call. But let me tell you what I want you to do as my brother Bill begins to play, I surrender all. I want you to call that dream to mind. I don't know what it is. It's none of my business. I want you to call that dream to mind, and I want you to hold that hand, the card in your hand. And the Spirit is telling me that there's somebody in here who doesn't yet know what their dream is. There's somebody in here seeking their dream. Hold that card in your hand. It's just a symbol. There's nothing magic about it, nothing religious about it. It's just a symbol. Hold it in your hand. God honors symbols. And if you don't know your dream, because in a moment I'm going to ask you to stand and sing. If you don't know your dream, when you rise, ask him for your dream. But don't ask him unless you're willing to go the whole nine yards and press and leave it and allow God. And if you do know your dream, if you do know it, I invite you to write it on the card. Not for me. I don't want to see it. I want you to keep the card. But I want you to write it on the card, and when you stand, stand to agree. You know, the word confess just means agree. Stand to confess and agree that that dream is no longer yours, but that you're going to lay it at the master's feet, break it wide open for God to do whatever it is God wants to do with your dream. Because until we release it to him fully, until we really do surrender all. God is so polite. He's not going to break in. He's not going to take your dream and do with it the manifold things he can do. Until you break it at his feet. Stand on your feet. Stand on your feet. And if you don't know your dream, as we sing together, you just ask God from the depths of a sincere heart to show you what your dream is. And if you do know, I invite you. And I'm serious. Don't make a vow that you're not going to keep. I invite you, if you really want the master to do something with your dreams, then you hold that card up and say, Lord, here it is. You gave it to me. I'm giving it back. And I invite you, God, to do with it and me what you will. Do you, do you this day surrender all? Let's sing all 